what, Steven Universe fans? The Steven Universe Podcast is returning with a special eight-part miniseries focusing on fan-favorite episodes and specials. The team behind these great stories will be sharing their incredible behind-the-scenes experience making these episodes. As a bonus, you fans will have the chance to ask them questions, too. So get ready for the return of the Steven Universe Podcast, October 26th at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to the last episode of the first season of the Steven Universe podcast. I'm Mackenzie Atwood coming to you one last time from the Steven Universe writers room at Cartoon Network Studios in Burbank, California. And we've got a huge episode for you. Rebecca and Steven Sugar are both back and they're sharing stories from their childhood that were specifically worked into episodes of Steven Universe. And as promised, Rebecca is also going to be answering a bunch of questions that you guys sent in online. But what I'm most excited about today is that Rebecca brought her ukulele and she's going to play something for us. She's going to debut a brand new song from an upcoming episode of Steven Universe. The song is called Escapism and it's awesome. So let's get to Rebecca and Steven Sugar who are sitting here with me. Thank you guys so much for coming back and talking to me again. Thanks for having us again. <laughs> yeah, of yeah. course. Awesome. So let's kick it off. I think you guys mentioned um, one of the stories was about a comic called Nightmare in Birdland. Yeah. You want to tell us about that? Yeah. I mean, this, I think it made it into the show, not necessarily as a, like a plot in the show, but as kind of the premise of the show as a project. I think we, so we were in, we were in high school, right? Yeah, this was for the... Was I in college and you were in high school? Uh, yeah, because I was a senior. This is my Visual Arts Center uh, thesis project. Yeah, yeah. So I had been doing comics for what, me and Steven had always been drawing comics together. And I agonize over comics. Like, I like I am such a perfectionist. And then in a weekend, Stephen did this comic that was just amazing. He did, it was, well, it was a 24-hour comic yeah. called Nightmare in Birdland. And I was just shocked because, well, first of all, it was so good. And it was, like, funny and amazing and perfect. And you did it so fast. <laughs> and it had, this, it had this character bus wrinkle in it, which was really strange. It was, like, some sort of inside Wait, joke. Wait, what? Uh, yeah, it was a bad drawing of, of Bullwinkle from Rock and Bullwinkle I did uh, that a high school friend of mine didn't like, and so I would draw it for her and uh, hide it with her art so she would find it. Yeah, yeah, uh, Bus Wrinkle. So it was like Bus Wrinkle was threatening Birdland. Right. It, the whole idea was I, I always wanted to be the perfectionist that you were with my comics, and so I had taken on this thesis project that was going to be uh, traditionally inked and, and watercolored, and it was going to be the sort of challenge in you know doing really like legit comics. And I spent a while trying to learn those skills, and it didn't come together. And sort of right as I was getting up to the due date for it, I realized that I just didn't like any of this thing I was making. Uh, so right at the last minute, I kind of scrapped the work I had done and, and redid it all really on the fly. <laughs> Uh, as this weird idea using that character and uh, wait, yeah. so it wasn't a twenty-four hour comic. Oh, no, you just was. made it. it, and, it oh, okay. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of older ideas that I got rid of and then made this twenty-four gotcha. hour comic uh, the yeah. last minute. I think, and I remember, I, I was shocked because I'd never seen you draw birds before, and all, of a, really sudden, and all of a sudden, you did this thing that was completely about birds, and I was like, why did you do this thing about birds? And you said, well, I didn't know how to draw birds, and now I do. And that yeah. blew my mind and completely <laughs> changed the way I thought about every project since, because I was like, oh, you could start a project specifically about something that you don't know how to do and, and know how to do it by the time you're done, and you had done that in a weekend, so it was just like... Everything changed for me. Where I was, I was like, I have to start building projects around a thing I want to be good at. Like that's when I kind of learned that from you, and I think that's why this really relates to Stephen because that's what Stephen is. There's so many things in the show that I was ambitious about learning how to do, but didn't know how to do when I started. Right. And uh, I think also the nature of the show, the way that it changes and grows as we work on it, is because of that idea which i learned from you when you did nightmare in birdland which is, which is start a project specifically about something you don't know how to do and then you'll know how to do it when you're done that seems scary because like i feel like i've tried to do that and then i still don't know how to do it in the end i just i, I just have be, a really bad do it, project do it with you the, know the pressure of a assignment a being due in a day. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> fair. that's fair okay cool um, so the second story you guys talked about was about a TV on the floor that sort of inspired the fact that Stephen doesn't know 
how to use a, a TV stand or whatever yeah, in, his, Steven, in his house. Steven's loft, the TV that's on the ground in Steven's loft is this really specific thing. Everything's from around the same time. No, this must have been, this was my first year in college. I came home. It was the summer after. Summer after. So you were, yeah. you were a junior, I think, in high school then? Yeah, I was going into my junior year. Yeah, and um, so I came home from school, and I had a TV that was in my dorm, and we just sort of dumped it on the floor in the living room because there was nowhere for it to go. And instead of, like, putting it somewhere, or I guess, like, using our parents' TV, we started just huddling around this TV on the floor, and we plugged the Super Nintendo into right. it. We, we kind of uh, co-opted the living room into a, a <laughs> summer workstation. So we had a, a big homosote panel that we were using for painting, and uh, we had this TV set up in the middle, and we would just sort of hang out in there all day. Yeah, and we'd uh, just like, sit on the floor and <laughs> play games on this TV that was on the floor, Yeah, which was simultaneously the most lazy and productive time ever. I think that's what felt so good about it. It was, yeah. like, it was like, this thing was just there, and it was just like, we just have to do this right now. We have to play games right now. Who cares that it's like not set up right? And then you were playing games. I was drawing. I was drawing so much while you were. We were playing Link to the Past. I remember that there was a huge storm, and the power went out, oh, we and lost we lost. We lost a ton of progress. Oh, no. And they're like, I hadn't saved them a, a long time. I uh, yeah, I did that once with the my GameCube was broken. Like the save slots didn't work. So like I was playing Wind Waker. I got far enough in that at that point I was like, well, I can't turn back now, you know. But like I can't save, so I just left it on. Oh, and, I did like, that. We could have saved, yeah. and I forgot to, and then I. Could Tripped over the power cord. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, for mine, we had to go on vacation. And, like, we went to the beach for, like, a week. And I just left it on at home. And I was like, probably the fire hazard. Probably not recommend. Like, not a good idea. Mm-hmm. Well, we came back and it was still on. And I was like, <laughs> I, and then I, I beat it. Oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's good. It. Yeah, it worked out for me. But I, it was a risky move. It was yeah. a risky move. Yeah. It's, yeah, that was, like, a really formative time. So I think if even in the earliest... This is what's sort of strange about it is that even in the earliest concepts for Steven's room, there's always been a TV sitting on the floor. That was like everything was kind of built around that yeah. image. I look, man, I was looking at the, my old drawings of that loft, and it's so structurally unsound. This is why I really needed. <laughs> I, I just drew <laughs> like crazy. I just drew like panels of wood that were just like up high. There's like no support. Or Steven's really good at thinking about how these things actually work. You're like, this kid's about to fall and die. Like, we can't, we can't have this. Yeah, I just, I was like a floor and it's up there. That's how this works, right? Especially especially with the TV, those things are heavy. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a hazard. It didn't make any (laughs) sense. So like, there's always those games on the the floor by the TV too, right? Do you have specific games that you're thinking of? Because, yeah, I am. Oh, those are specific. Yeah. That's specifically Wind Waker. It's it's Wind Waker and Animal Crossing. That's what I thought. Um, Which, uh, when I was doing the, the redesigns of the, loft uh during house guest and giving steven a gamecube and new games i really wanted to sort of give a shout out to the things that at that time were inspiring us on the show and that was when uh animal crossing new leaf had come out pretty recently right. we were playing a lot Everyone of that at work I, uh, I love there, that game <laughs> uh, yeah we would just at every lunch we would gather on the couch and we'd all play it together what, and was, then, your, what um, was your town i think i called it donut <laughs> donut that's so cute uh, just um, donut there, there's not enough letters like if you want to name it like Donut Land or something, it's like no, nope. yeah, you just gotta yeah, name it Donut. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, my town was called Slow Down. So, like I wanted a thing, a thing that would tell me to like slow down. Oh, you were like, <laughs> so every time I opened it, down. yeah, it would say like slow Rebecca, down. And then uh, my cat knocked my DS onto the floor and broke it. <laughs> really R.I.P. That's so sad. Did you lose the save then? I, I lost it all. It cracked oh. the screen. It, it broke it completely. Oh. That's so sad. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, uh, the the other story you guys had um, (laughs) was the one about Rose's Scabbard. Can you guys tell me about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think in terms of, there's not a specific incident, but the end of Rose's Rose's Scabbard was really specifically a thing that Steven used to do when I was really down. Like in high school when I was really bummed out or something had gone really wrong, and you would always know, obviously, because I'd be, like, moping around the house. And Steven sort of had this way of, if he saw me like that, it's like you wouldn't necessarily, like, ask what was going on, because you kind of already knew, because you knew everything that was going on with me. So you'd just, like, you'd put something on TV or you'd start playing a game or something that you knew that I would like, just so that I would know that you knew that it was for me. And it made such a huge 
like difference. Like it would always cheer me up because it was so unspoken that you would just drop what you were doing and do something to make me feel better. And so the end of that where he's like doing silly magic tricks out of lion. Yeah. You know, he's not asking her to like pour her guts out. Also, she's just been awful to him too. <laughs> <laughs> Is you know, like like unfathomably awful, but like I hope that's not really. No, that stuff. that part's not a uh, um, not yeah. from our past. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that way that um, especially with like heartbreak stuff, like you'd always you you'd know and you'd just find some way to get my mind off it like instantly, and it was really important to me. I don't know what I would have been like if I hadn't had you around at those times. So that's so pure. I love that. Thank you guys so much for coming and talking to me. Thanks for having us again. Yeah. So now Rebecca Sugar is going to answer the questions you guys sent in online. Rebecca's Q&A is coming up next. Hey, everybody. This is the Steven Universe podcast, and I'm so excited to welcome Rebecca Sugar, the creator of Steven Universe, back to the show. We have her here today. She's going to be answering questions that you guys have submitted through social media or that we fielded through uh, Comic-Con. And uh, yeah, so let's just jump right into it. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me back. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the first question that was submitted by uh, Sergio was, if you were a gym, what diamond would you follow? <laughs> um, this, is a, this is a really interesting question. I think I would probably be a blue diamond gem. They tend to be diplomats, intellectuals. Mm -hmm. um, but then they're also a little cold, which isn't really right. So... It might be. Uh, I'm trying. I don't know if I can answer this without it being a little bit of a spoiler. Yeah. But I, actually, I'd probably be in Pink's court. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> um, probably, but blue, but blue somewhere in between. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'd be a purple. It reminds. <laughs> it reminds me of the Hogwarts houses. Mm -hmm. Is the, the similar vibe, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Second question is from Jacob. Uh, what kind of cars would the Crystal Gems drive? Ah, this is funny because in the very, very old shield board episode that got thrown out, they did drive a car. Wait, she, what? There was a board that we did right after the pilot that we never ac actually made. Oh. Um, and it got repurposed into several different episodes. Gotcha. Um, so it was sort of a proto laser light, proto gem glow. Is that some of that in the art book? Yes, yes. There's a few I pages. There's something about like they're they're like hiding their appearance or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At that point, they would sort of disguise themselves to go right. into, into town, and they also had a car, which was a really <laughs> crummy Toyota Corolla. Good. Because that's what I had <laughs> when I was in high school. It was like a, I think it was a 1991 Toyota Corolla, which ended up kind of becoming the Don die. Because um, oh. one of the things about that early episode is that Pearl would drive the car, and then it was just an unwritten, unspoken thing that Pearl just knew how to drive. She's so you'll see her driving the, the van. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll see her driving things, and it's because she drove this car. Good. Uh, and then eventually, like over 100 episodes later, she drives the Don Dye. <laughs> <laughs> That's That was like us bringing back this Toyota. Nice. That's awesome. Next question is from Jennifer. Uh, what inspired the gem placements on the gems in general? Well, for the main characters... It was very specific. I, I figured it would relate to who they are. Uh, so Pearl is a little too inside her own head, and she's an intellectual, so she has her gem embedded in her head. Mm -hmm. And Amethyst is passionate and impulsive and is sort of speaking from the heart all the time, so she has it on her chest. Um, and then uh, Garnet is really hands-on and active, and uh, she's also extremely balanced. So Garnet having a gem on both hands felt right. Mm -hmm. And I think that every time we come up with new gems, we try and evaluate who they are based on where their gem is placed and the color and the sort of style of their gemstone. Cool. Okay, so this one is from Paul. What is Amethyst's favorite soda? A lot of people in the show drink apple cedra. Have you, have you I do not know what that... <laughs> Wait, is that the one that Pearl drank yeah. in that episode? She was like, I'm going to... Drink some apple juice today. Yeah, yeah. Our, our prop designer, right, which is actually, actually apple soda, um, our prop designer, Angie, drew in this very specific apple soda gotcha. that, we, that we would always use. There's also like a, a sort of generic prop of a sort of can of store brand sort of Coke style mm -hmm. soda, but uh, my favorite one is always to use is always the 
very specific apple guacola cedar. though oh well i mean nobody, <laughs> nobody likes that yeah I, amethyst would i feel like uh, uh onion likes it true, Am- true. I, i'm going to say amethyst doesn't like it she does not <laughs> she drinks engine oil so that must be saying something it's that's, that's that bad that's true we kind of had a theory that she doesn't necessarily taste food the way human beings do so maybe she maybe she does yeah maybe it's just maybe she, that I mean, she could tolerate it yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> i don't think that would be i think that would be a texture issue. right right. that's why i think it, yeah. wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily matter it's yeah, like i don't I think the texture of guacola is i mean I, I always imagine it being like if you mixed carbonated soda water with guacamole <laughs> that that would be the texture of guacola so disgusting <laughs> uh, yeah i think it, it would not be good yeah this one's an interesting one um from naomi uh are the off colors meant to parallel or be inspired by characters from Alice in Wonderland? Oh, they're all inspired by many different things. That's definitely in there, especially for fluorite. Fluorite's very inspired by oh, yeah. the caterpillar. I, I saw somebody was like they they compared like the the rabbit that was really late to Paprasha, like because you know like <laughs> well I think the rabbit knows that he's late yeah so it's a little different <laughs> yeah. but I, I think it's that's very I, these are very perceptive theories they're all sort of a, a mix of things I think the caterpillar was big for fluorite but also we were taking a couple cues from like grandmother willow <laughs> which is totally <laughs> right a little unrelated uh, yeah but yeah that's definitely. Those theories are great. It's very on point. Okay, cool. This one's from Vanessa. What is Pearl's favorite color? I mean, it's pink. I think it would be. Oh. She has a real thing <laughs> for, yeah, um, probably for pink hair. Probably should have assumed that one, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Cree and Mataverse wanted you to weigh in on the pineapple pizza debate. I love pineapple on pizza. Actually, one of my favorite pizza topping combos is pineapples and jalapenos and it's really good i was a vegetarian for a really long time that's wild and that was a big go-to <laughs> that's awesome for me. tom it wants to know do you feel you owe your skills and art to seeking out knowledge and practicing on your own to formal education or some relationship in between that's an interesting question because it's absolutely both i definitely sought out knowledge and practiced on my own which was part of why i sought out art school and then practiced in art school but i was always doing projects on my own in addition to school i was never only doing art for school so i think anybody that first off i think you absolutely don't have to go to art school you can completely search for the resources on your own and make a ton of work i there are people on the team that didn't go to art school that were doing their own projects especially comics. I come from independent comics and I was doing all of those. I never did that as part of school. I always did that on my own. And I feel like I learned most of what I still think about in terms of writing from experimenting with independent comics. Gotcha. So I would say yes and yes, both are good and doing both at the same time, even better. Right. Yeah. Uh, next one is from Alex. Steven doesn't like square pizza, right? What inspired that? Um, we actually really love square pizza. There I used love to square there pizza. used to be a um a place near where we grew up called Lido's where we would go. And Ben actually Ben Levin, our writer, actually worked mm-hmm. at a Lido's because oh. we're, we're both Marylanders. I was like, oh my gosh, you worked there. Gotcha. Um, anyway, so I really like square pizza. I think that was written. I believe that was written by Paul Vileko, who I'll have to ask him <laughs> what he has against square pizza. Yes, what is his problem with square pizza? Um, but I thought it was really funny, yeah. so I kept it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Nice. Okay. Not sure how to say this name, but uh, Sadame, I think is how I'm going to say it like that. What is your favorite job to do in animation? Like storyboarding, character designs, background, etc. I would say definitely storyboarding if it's a storyboard-driven show. When I started working on Adventure Time, uh, where, you're, where I was boarding and writing at the same time, just like my storyboarders do on this show, it was the best. There was so much freedom it was writing and drawing simultaneously. I could even write and draw and do music and then draw and write to the music that I was writing. I mean, it's it felt the most like filmmaking right. of any one job I've had in animation. I haven't had a lot of jobs in animation, honestly, but I, but I have made a lot of films and I made a lot of independent comics. And so once I was suddenly storyboarding and writing, it, it felt so much like everything I had practiced making my own work. Gotcha. Jamie is asking, what is your favorite arc of One Piece? Well, I'm really behind, but uh, I love the Soge King Usopp versus Luffy fight arc. That that all of that. I love Usopp. Usopp's my favorite character, so everything involving Usopp 
is gotcha. is my favorite thing. But that was so amazing. Like I just love because I think he's so interesting because he is so insecure. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then and I always loved him for that. So that arc, the fact that it was just coming to a head where it's like everyone has advanced and now they have these just incredible extraordinary godlike powers and he's still just a person <laughs> and like he knows that he's just out here <laughs> yeah he's just been sort of stewing on it for so long or he's just like got so much to prove and then the way that luffy's just like of course you can't win against me and it's just like he knows oh it's, oh my god i cried oh i really really loved that part i've not seen one piece but now i want to <laughs> <laughs> oh I, well, i'm totally ruined that's <laughs> yeah, it's really it's really great uh, Small Paradorito wants to know, does pumpkin need to eat or sleep? That's a good question. I pumpkin... guess that extends to the watermelon people too, right? Yeah. Pumpkin doesn't need to eat, but pumpkin does sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's true. I know that we've seen him sleep. It's like the gym. It's just like the gyms, right? I mean, they can. They, they can sleep to. if they want to. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I suppose that pumpkin is getting his nutrients from light although he's not mm -hmm. he's not still on the vine so <laughs> um but he's he's magic and you know the thing about steven's magic and i mean it gives people extended life mm -hmm. which has been established that's true yeah. for those for those plants as well okay cool michael williams wants to know is steven universe canonically just a cartoon and if so is sardonyx aware of this i guess like uh is sardonyx <laughs> like a, a godlike being that just knows that it she's in a cartoon and <laughs> yeah <laughs> um right is steven universe canonically a cartoon like is it self-aware i guess i mean i think well yes yeah, sardonyx is self-aware i think steven universe is canonically just a cartoon in the in the canon of real life <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh within the show it's reality but sardonyx has a this transcendent mind i think of sardonyx a little like psycho mantis she, from what? From, from what was that? From Metal Gear. Oh, um, she can see outside of what's going on, you know, and that's something that I feel like you know Garnet can see beyond mm -hmm. uh, the moment, you know, into gotcha. the, into the future, and not just into the future, but all of these possible, <laughs> all of these possible futures. Right. Um, so Sardonyx is sort of on this other level where she has that ability, but she's Pearl's also in there, so it's also obnoxious. <laughs> Good. You know, it's all, she's also like above everything <laughs> in, this, in this way that's very frustrating okay, cool. about Pearl. Brees is wondering, is that theory where Garnet's glasses change the ratio of red or blue depending on if Ruby or Sapphire's personality is dominant at that time? Is that true? Do you know the theory? I know that theory. Yeah. That's It's a really interesting theory, but it's not true. No. No. R.I.P. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there are many cases where Garnet is in a, in a lighting situation where her glasses are not actually red and blue. Oh, so, so it doesn't that really would, work. <laughs> that would become Im impossible to uh, carry through all of the time. But her glasses have always had, in the regular daylight, a blue and pink sheen that did represent ruby and sapphire, even right. before people knew. Gotcha. But um, it doesn't mean... But the, the, yeah, the ratio of one to the other doesn't represent... And the, the thing about Garnet, too, is that she's not being piloted by two people she's her own person right um so there really is no one's in control then these uh, the others in control there are no moments that are like that yeah i like uh when people try to break down like what internal conversation she's having mm -hmm. and that's not untrue i think just like anyone you'll have competing thoughts in your mind that you'll try to navigate and that's her experience as as, as a person but she is her own person gotcha so. Okay, cool. Aiden wants to know, are the Zircons okay? I also want to know this. Are they alive? <laughs> um, I would say yes and no. They, uh, they're, uh, they're poofed. They're not shattered. But they're, okay. they're certainly not, not in trouble. But they're not shattered. But they're not shattered. Okay. I can rest easy now. No they're not shattered. I got really attached to Blue Zircon especially. <laughs> Thank you. Rachel wants to know, do the concept of superheroes exist in the universe of Steven Universe? Um, I think it's different. The world in Steven Universe is different because there was this invasion that happened mm -hmm. um, 6,000 years ago, and the map of the world is different. The culture of the world is different. The population of the world is, is very different in this universe, and I don't think superheroes necessarily exist in the same way i mean there's 
obviously characters like the characters that exist in dog copter like action movies exist mm-hmm. you know lonely blade exists right but i think when it comes to stories of people with these powers that are beyond human powers there's something a little i wouldn't say it's more normal in their universe but they have a different relationship to it because of this ancient experience that human beings had gotcha. in this version of our world cool absol ex guardian wants to know was there a specific vibe or reference that you or the other character designers are going for with the Zircons? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of very specific references. I think it started with Paul was showing me all this interesting history about a nightclub in Paris called Le Monocle. Mm-hmm. And the Monocle as this oh, right. uh, amazing, like iconic lesbian fashion statement <laughs> uh, from, awesome. from a very long time ago. So I was I, I was fascinated by that history. Then I, there are all these other characters that we wanted to work in. I, I really like the jesters in. There's an old Disney cartoon. I think it's called What's the Truth About Mother Goose that has these very mm-hmm. specific jesters, and I really liked them. And then Jughead. <laughs> we wanted <laughs> this. Is the, I really wanted to make a gem with uh, Jughead nose. There's also a film that I love, a Russian film called Film, 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 which has this character everyone's trying to make a film and there's this character that's the writer and it's something me me and Paul also used to watch all the time Uh, and the writer is the one that's writing the script and he's pacing and he's really stressed out and he can't figure anything out if you look up film 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 you can see how Blue Zircon especially is inspired by the writer in this Russian film gotcha Um, holding it together also it's my favorite film everyone should watch it Uh, oh yeah yeah, it's my favorite (laughs) film 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 (laughs) that's awesome Catherine wants to know, is the unfamiliar familiar an intentional reference to his dark materials and, you know, just or basically anything, I guess? Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I love his dark materials. Yes, that's awesome. Yeah, it blew And my I mind. think that I cut off this part of the question, but Catherine wanted to let you know that you have good taste. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, <laughs> you know, I was right. I was like, I think it was 12 and 13 while I was reading them. I was like a really good age to have it completely blow my mind. Gotcha. Tyler wants to know, do gems that have their gem over their eye have any sight impairments? That's a really interesting question. I think that it could affect their depth perception. But I don't know if gems necessarily function the way humans do. I think if anything, they might even have some sort of enhanced sight. Because I think like your laser vision. <laughs> maybe. Like your gem your gem placement, I think, has a lot to do with like like I said like you as a as a person and even eyeball I mean was sort of scrutinizing everything Mm -hmm. then I suppose also other senses could be heightened but that's very human I think gems gems are different they work a little differently does that mean that Jasper has really good sense of smell uh (laughs) oh that I don't know uh maybe not I mean that was sort of just a simple like hard-nosed right (laughs) uh like thought you know, as a as a, a way a person can be, not necessarily, yeah, interesting. Abby wants to know, is it possible for a non-fusion gem to have the same gem type as a fusion? Like, if there's a way to have a garnet that is just one gem? Absolutely. Ooh, Absolutely possible. Interesting. Sorry. I think, oh, they wouldn't be the same, though. Oh, they would look different? Uh, than, the, than the fusion type? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, so mm-hmm. they would, they, gotcha. They would be something else, yeah. And they would be probably not you know, giant or anything. Well, it would very, it would depend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nicholas uh. wants to ask, would you want an OKKO crossover and what characters would get along? <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, I would. We actually had this, so we made the pilots at the same time, mm-hmm. um, back when OKKO was called oh, L- right. Lakewood, Lakewood Plaza Turbo. And we used to have this dream because we didn't know like which of us would end up getting a show or if either of us would, mm-hmm. but we would dream like, oh, if, if, we both got to do a show, we should do a crossover and we'd call it Steewood Plavin Turbiverse. <laughs> and we would just mush the shows together. Uh, and so you'd have like Mr. Garnet and Caven <laughs> and Peanid. And I think it, I, I can't remember if it was uh, Radithist or Amicles. Uh, I think it was Radithist. Um, anyway, we had this whole plan. This was before we'd actually been through the experience of making a show, which now looking back at that plan, would be so unbelievably hard to make because you, instead of just using two characters that exist, you'd have to basically make an entirely new show from yeah. scratch. Um, also, it's not called Liquid Plaza yeah. Turbo anymore, <laughs> but I always loved 
that idea. And there's a lot of parallels with the characters just in general because we both love a lot of the same things. Yeah. And we were both working on it at the same time. And I think also Ian's contribution to Stephen is so incredibly huge mm -hmm. that a lot of, uh, like, we got to experiment with a lot of things within Stephen that I think he's really, like, taking to another level in OKKO. OK awesome. OK, cool. Thank you so much for answering all these fan questions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks again to Rebecca for answering all those questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's. We tried, but we got so many and we just ran out of time. But thank you for sending them. And who knows, maybe we'll have a chance to do this again sometime. All right, coming up, the moment we've been waiting for, Rebecca and her ukulele. It's a brand new Steven Universe song making its debut right here on the podcast. Next. Okay, we're back in the Steven Universe writer's room, and I'm here with Rebecca Sugar, and today we have a very special treat for you guys. Uh, Rebecca's going to be singing and uh, playing ukulele for a new song that has never been heard before. It's from an upcoming episode, right, Rebecca? Mm-hmm. This is a song called Escapism. Okay, cool. That in this awful place I shouldn't show a trace of doubt But pulled against the green I feel a little pain That I would rather do without I'd rather be free be free 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 from here how awesome is that song called escapism and i cannot wait to see the new episode that it's going to be a part of thank you so much to rebecca for playing that for us and with that this marks the end of volume one of the steven universe podcast throughout these 10 episodes we've taken a look at inside how steven universe is made hearing it from the creators themselves i hope you guys have enjoyed it i know i have this has been a crazy journey for me as a fan to come out here and meet everyone and it, i could not be more grateful so i want to thank a few people First of all, thank you to my friends and family for supporting me, especially my parents and Alice for always helping me brainstorm. Thanks so much to all my friends at Cartoon Network back in Atlanta for all the support and mentorship, especially the games team. I also want to give a huge thanks to Dwayne for making this summer a possibility and the rest of the social media team as well. Thank you, Rob Sorcher, for giving me this chance. And thank you to Brian Miller, Brian Robillard, and Christina Miller for helping facilitate this huge undertaking. And of course, I want to thank the whole crew universe for being so gracious and having me out here this summer. A special thanks to Lisa Zunich, as I have no idea how we would have done this without your help. And thank you to the incredibly talented and brilliant voice cast and all the other guests who came on the show. And of course, there's the main podcast team, Conrad, Charles, and Stacy. You guys have been absolutely brilliant, so thank you so much for everything. And finally, I want to thank Rebecca Sugar for giving me this opportunity. And of course, thank you, Rebecca, for making Steven Universe. The show has done so much good for so many people, including me. So last but not least, thanks to all of you listeners who have supported the podcast, especially those of you who followed me on Tumblr and YouTube and cheered me on when I started this project. I'm so grateful, and I'm looking forward to what the future holds for us. But in the meantime, you can keep up with everything I'm doing by following my Twitter at MKAtwood. And remember, don't stop believing in Steven. Steven.